I'm Andy Nidell. And I'm Pat from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. This is part two of Cliffs of Gallipoli. Now, we covered this song in two episodes so I could cover two aspects of the topic. And the song took us all the way from Sweden to Turkey. The initial Gallipoli landings, which we covered in part one, had been both a tactical and strategic failure. The Allied troops held onto their beachheads and had managed to conquer a few ridges and hills around the landing sites, but that was nothing compared to the objective set for them. The invasion plans were far too ambitious and were based on the belief that the Ottomans would be easy enemies to defeat. By May, the Allies should have cleared the whole peninsula. Instead, the Ottomans had the advantage, and they brought in reinforcements, machine guns and howitzers, while fortifying the higher ground. German General Lehmann von Sanders had had time to read the reports of his Turkish officers and commit his reserves. And although their localized counterattacks were stopped by the invaders, it was clear that they would not just sit and remain passive forever. On the night of May 19th, the Ottomans gathered a large force of fresh reinforcements from Constantinople and Smyrna under Esad Pasha. Thousands of cheerful young men, praying for God's help, went over the top towards the enemy. But the Anzacs facing them had been well aware of the build-up to the attack. As daylight broke, 10,000 casualties littered the narrow fields of no man's land, piled on top of one another. Like everywhere in this war, the firepower of entrenched machine guns and determined riflemen had created an impassable wall. And the Ottomans learned a lesson by blood. Never again here would they try to attack on such a large scale and instead would focus on smaller skirmishes, raids, and their relentless snipers. Soon, the stench of rotting flesh in the summer's heat was too much to bear. A short armistice was arranged, and men from both sides went onto the battlefield to bury the dead. It was the first time here that the men came to know each other without violence. Curious looks and even small gifts were exchanged. Trench warfare set in on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and soldiers on both sides realized they were going to be there for a while. To escape the constant threat of shells and sniper fire, men began to disappear under the earth into trenches and dugouts. The peninsula was soon transformed into a maze of trenches, saps and strong points zigzagging through the rough countryside. Both sides mined and countermined each other, while on the surface, skirmishes were fought all the time over the narrow plateaus, steep ridges and hilltops, places like, like Dead Man's Ridge, Battleship Hill or Lone Pine were constantly contested, and yet, at Anzac Cove, the men found ways to communicate with the enemy. No one wanted to die needlessly, so, so sometimes instead of bombs, they might throw a pack of cigarettes over the parapets or toss across a can of bully beef. The French on the far right at Hellas had similar live and let live arrangements with their enemies. Like if both sides had to cross a certain gully to bring in fresh water, they would plant little flags or signposts, and as long as no one ventured further than that, they would not be shot at. In the British sector of Hellas, though, there was no such fraternization. Ottoman high command loathed the British imperialists and thought them to be the major aggressor in this war. Both sides fired at the slightest sign of movement, harassed each other day and night with artillery, and gave no quarter during advances. The overall situation at Gallipoli changed little over the summer. The Allies needed more men and artillery to achieve anything bigger than taking the next ridge before them, and the Ottomans had all the time in the world to strengthen their defenses. Here and there, brave attacks and successful bluffs continued to improve the Allied positions, but they did not change the overall stalemate, and larger assaults led to massacres and huge casualties for both sides. While the Ottomans were defending their homeland against foreign invaders, the sense of the whole point of the campaign began to be lost among the Allies. Clearly, they were not winning this battle, and clearly they were not advancing towards Constantinople. They could not even advance towards the next ridge without losing friends and comrades. The dehydration due to the constant lack of water, which they had to import from across the sea, the ever-present sniper fire, the flies, fever, 
lice, dysentery, morale plummeted, as did the health of the soldiers. Because life at Gallipoli was never safe. You could dodge bullets, you could dodge shells, but it was harder to dodge illness or dodge exhaustion. High command was aware of the lack of progress, but, but what to do? Send in more men in the hope of achieving something? Was victory even still possible? And if not, how to end this? British Secretary of State for War Lord Kitchener feared the loss of British prestige in the Islamic world if they retreated. Such a retreat might also encourage other nations to join the Central Powers. But you know, the common soldiers cared little for such concerns. They will never leave our hearts or fade away. August was supposed to change things. A new landing at Suvla Bay that would open the possibility of a left hook and in concert with a breakout attempt at Anzac Cove would disrupt the Ottoman hold over the peninsula and finally open up a way to the Sari Bayer Ridge. Diversions for the landing at Suvla took place all over the peninsula. But though there was still a lot of fight left in the exhausted Anzac troops, the plans of high command were simply out of range of what was physically possible. And the landings at Suvla Bay faced the same problems as the landings before that we saw in part one. Under fire and in unmapped territory, the men quickly lost track of time and space. And although they advanced quite a bit inland, they were soon checked by determined Ottoman reserves and had to dig in. They did not meet any of their objectives. The August battles brought no major changes to the overall situation. A fatalistic mood set in over the Allied forces. In September and October, men and guns were further worn out and the weather began to turn. The heat and the flies vanished, sure, but the approaching winter was even more threatening. The thought of evacuation began making the rounds. By October 14th, General Sir Ian Hamilton, in charge since the beginning, was dismissed and General Sir Charles Monroe took his place. Monroe had a more realistic approach than Hamilton. By the end of October, he had visited all three landing sites and came to the conclusion that the whole campaign was nothing short of total disaster. The Ottomans still occupied the dominating heights and the overall lack of sufficient artillery and supplies would not challenge that. He telegraphed his opinions back to Kitchener, but Kitchener didn't believe him and went to see for himself. And yeah, Kitchener could barely hide his shock over the whole situation either. By the end of November, the War Committee had approved the evacuation. Problem was that this is easier said than done. Immediate evacuation would result in a massacre if the Ottomans caught them halfway through, but with winter approaching, they could not wait for long. The temperatures dropped significantly. Heavy rain poured in from the heights down into the trenches. Cold winds from the sea hit the exposed troops. Frostbite grew rampant. Although the Ottoman soldiers were in the same boat, they at least had a short supply chain bolstered by gifts of things like winter clothing from the people of Constantinople. The only real option for the Allies was to evacuate without the Ottomans realizing it. The plan was that they would lull the Ottomans by reducing activities to a minimum. The Anzacs and the, the 80,000 men at Suvla Bay were first. As they stopped responding to the enemy's shelling, the Ottomans came forward, but were met with rifle fire. As this was repeated, the Ottomans got used to the silence. Over weeks, the Allied lines were gradually thinned out until only a screening force remained. Sappers began booby-trapping the trenches, supply stores and dugouts with tripwire explosives. On the night of December 18th, the final evacuation began. The Ottomans suspected nothing and in fact were only alerted by the fire and explosions as the last men set the fuses. The evacuation was a masterpiece in planning and execution, but what about Hellas? Now that the Ottomans knew what was up, could they be fooled again? By diverse patterns of counterfire, periods of silence, they gave the Ottomans a false sense of activity until January 8th, when the evacuation of Hellas finally began. The last men in the trenches were almost crazy with nerves because if the Ottomans had sniffed out their little trick, they could easily overrun the beaches. But the night remained silent. Everything that could not be brought away was booby-trapped or destroyed. It was not until the last British soldiers had left the beaches that the first Ottoman patrols caught wind of the evacuation. The evacuations were complete successes. At the shore 
line Blood of heroes stains the land Lights a candle One for each of the dead who falls and die in vain the full story of this battle, the Dardanelles, is clad in many tales and legends, which I encourage you to look up for yourself. But it had some lasting effects, even long beyond the war. For the Australians and New Zealanders, the Anzacs, the fight for Gallipoli grew into a part of their national identity. It was their baptism in fire and the beginning of a unique legacy separate from, from Britain and the British Empire. And for the Turks, the battle actually served to form a bond of friendship between those former enemies. They shared the same feelings of pride and valor, sacrifice and loss. This is perhaps best expressed by the following words attributed to Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives, you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmets to us, where they lie side by side here in this country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are at peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. Now, at the very beginning, you said this song took us from Sweden to Turkey. Can you tell them a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, the whole idea, I mean, we get a lot of emails like, write a song about this, write a song about that. But when it actually came to Clips of Gallipoli, we were playing a show in Netherlands. In the Netherlands? Yes. Okay. And uh, a guy came, uh, he was a songwriter, uh, pre, uh, a songwriter doing uh, several big artists in Turkey. Okay. He explained that, I have an idea how you can write a song about something that you probably never heard about. And it's about my home country, Turkey. Okay. And uh, a battle that took place there. And it will fit totally to your, uh, to your music. This guy came prepared and he gave me the, this whole bunch of papers. Yeah? He, but he you came... knew the name Gallipoli before or no? Had you heard? No. I mean, this, this is a song that has many years in the making. Right. It became like something uh, for, for Turkish people. This was very important. Yeah. It is important for the Anzacs as well, for, yeah. for, uh, for Australians and New Zealanders. And, and forming the, that friendship between the enemies, between the Turks and, and the Anzacs. That, that was one of the things that inspired us from the beginning. Like the, the speech about the Turk or the memorial wall. Right. Where it says that here... It, no nationality needs to be mattered because here we are all brothers. This, this stone was very important in the inspiration for writing the song. After we released it, we, we were not sure like where, what is going to happen now, but then we got the invitation because this guy uh, he had some contacts in, in Turkey and he was like, guys, I think that you need to perform the song in Turkey. That's cool. And I was excited because we had never been there. So, of course, I'm always open to playing in new places. Yeah, sure. When we were sitting in the restaurant, all the TVs, we constantly saw advertisement for us. Wow. This was something we had never seen before. Yeah. Today, we've, yeah, but we, this was we have before seen you got that Yeah, big. yeah. This is more than 10 years ago. So, this was the first time we actually saw, like, wow, we're on TV. Yeah. We saw the interest for Sabaton once we landed there it was ridiculously big. And what people hmm. would do when, when, when we just wanted to have an ice cream, you know, they, they would clear tables for us in a, in a bar so yeah. that we can have an ice cream. The big event was, of course, Sabaton performing yeah. in a TV. Yeah. And um, th this was a quite big television channel and nothing that we have ever done before. But it was hilarious how it worked on set. Because in a big TV station, normally you have strict rules yeah, yeah, what, sure. what is happening. But in this case, I, I think that all of them were so excited about having us there yeah, that's really that they cool. didn't care about rules. That's awesome. So we were allowed to do whatever we wanted in the studio mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and play as much as we wanted. So it ended up with us playing pretty much uh, a set. 
like a like a gig on Turkish TV. Uh, yeah. On Turkish TV, and there were people in the crowd and uh, sitting there, and there. It was an absolutely amazing story, and uh, I loved th that thing. Was what, what the Cliffs of Gallipoli led to. Well, thank you very much, Per. Okay, that's it for Cliffs of Gallipoli, and this was Sabaton History. So that's it for this week. And if you become a Patreon on uh, some of the levels, you have a possibility to get a special edition of the Sabaton new album and all the previous albums. So don't forget to become a subscriber of the YouTube channel, become a Patreon, and see you soon.